But then, yeah, it'd still be good to get okay, you Okay, we are, out. we are streaming. I don't know what channel we're streaming on, so hi there if hi. you are. Let's see if we're actually connected. I just logged in on my account. Oh, we're there. But then I put like, I chose the My RV Works brand. Okay. I don't know, my connection's really slow. Hi and welcome and we're, if you're, <laughs> if you're there, if we're actually live, hey, we'll be starting very soon. Yeah, it looks like it. Okay, great. Just when we thought we had all of our... We're using a new computer, computer. new setup. Mm -hmm. And we always think it's going to be easier. It's mainly getting logged into the correct yeah. login. I'm okay. looking myself here. So I'm going to go ahead. But if you give me the thumbs up, then I'll just ignore this. I'm just curious. Oh. Let's see. And we're recording, maybe? Let's see. Start recording. Yeah, it says April live stream. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, we're there. Yeah, it says April live stream. <laughs> okay, I'm convinced. <laughs> So we're moving our uh, recording to a different computer. Um, and uh, we thought we had everything ready. And then at the last minute, it's like, oh, we're not logged in. So we had to get that figured out. So we have several login accounts. And we were trying to figure out which login account to use. So thanks for hanging with us. But hopefully the <laughs> okay. next time we'll have this all figured out. It, it was just the, that last little piece we forgot. Oh, yeah, you log it's in? always that login that we forget. <laughs> okay, welcome to yeah. our monthly live stream. Evil. And we've got Wanda, Karen, Robin, Bruce, G. Miller. And let us know if you and... can hear us and see us. Okay, because we're it's a different computer. Yeah. Are you going to shut the door? No? Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. So um, our monthly live stream, we take viewer questions and answer them live. So anything that's RV uh, related, if you have a question that you wish that you could ask an RV tech, then we've got one here for you and you can do that here. So we'll have some uh, best practices on how to ask your questions, but we do have a few uh, pre-queued. So we'll go there. Um, Oh, Karen. Oh, thanks. God, has, she says, my husband has finally started watching your channel. Okay. Very cool. So uh, are you guys RVers? Yeah, let us know if you are if you are an RVer, if you are an RV tech, kind of what your interest is uh, in the RV world. So, um, yeah, so we have a few pre-queued questions. If you want, though, you can feel free to put your questions in the chat, and we'll start working our way through those once we get through these pre-queued ones. And um, just some best practices, just make sure that the device that you're talking about, if it's a refrigerator, a water heater, a furnace, whatever the specific appliances that you're referring to, give us the model number and the manufacturer if you have it. Um, that'll be helpful uh, with answering your questions. And what's another best practice? Let's see. You talked about the lengths of the text amounts. That you can yeah you might have to use more than one you're limited in the number of characters so we check grammar one. and spelling so make sure it's properly formatted we don't but you can just <laughs> glance over before you hit enter because sometimes it gets real confusing it's a water heater not a hot water heater so yeah uh yeah so feel free to put those in uh in the chat any questions that you have let us know where you're from and um let us know are you an rver are you an rv tech and um, in just a little bit, I'm going to have an exciting announcement, too. So why don't we go to our first question? I'm ready. Um, actually, our first question, uh, we don't have an answer for. We just want to make sure because we said we would, or I said that we would answer it on here, but we're not going to. So, Tim, the shower drain question that you have, um, Darren is just going to recommend talk to a plumber. I, I talk to a plumber. I'd walk down the aisle and read the label and like, yep, sounds like it's going to work. Um, I, if the concern is what's going to happen in your tank, um, uh, anything septic safe would work. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't. Okay. I have pulled globs of stuff out of this pee traps and all that kind of stuff. But uh, I know there's products that will eat all that up. So if the concern is what's it going to do to your tank environment, um, is, if it's septic safe, I think it's good. But there may be... Uh, for that kind of stuff, the forums are really good. Um, the full timing type forums where people discuss different topics is a good place to get information on what to pour down your drain to keep your drains clear. Um, it's just, I don't really know. 
<laughs> just trying something out. That's fine. Okay, yeah. What do you and Anne use? Do you use anything in particular on your RVs? No. Okay. All right. So it, it, that's an Anne question. So I, oh, I, don't okay. know. I shave. I wash my teeth. And, and she'll be yeah. here in about. Yeah. So that's the other thing. Okay. So you guys. A lot guys, of changes at our end. Yeah. All good changes. Yeah. <laughs> so Sid is working tonight. Anne is just now getting off work. That's new. Um, it's just yeah, like I said, we're trying right a different now, yeah. setup. So I've got two screens, but using one computer, all really good stuff. But I'm just um, sitting here. Just, yeah, <laughs> throw in a, a loop for our on a new On a to. different computer. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll get better. It's all <laughs> for good. It's all moving us in a better direction. So this is all exciting. And thanks for joining us. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so Dale, um, and I have a picture I'll share in just a minute to our viewers. I know you've already seen it. He says, hey, I have been watching your videos and they have been very helpful. The other day I opened the furnace to check the burner assembly and I found the burner looked like the picture above. Okay, so she's gonna share a picture. Looked like that. Any idea what could have caused this? Have you ever seen a burner do this? Yes. Okay, so let's show that picture again. Um, okay, so what we have there is that is the burner uh, inside of a suburban furnace. Okay, if you have an Atwood furnace, it doesn't look, an Atwood or a Dometic furnace, it does not look like that. So that right there is from a suburban furnace. Okay, now they're supposed to be nice and like an ice cream, like a fudge sickle or something, okay? And his is all wavy and all this kind of stuff. So it gets into the question, what is supposed to be injected into that? And it's supposed to be oxygen and a gas vapor. It's supposed to be sprayed in through a small orifice, just the right amount of um, um, inches of water column. We talk about propane and, and the inches of water column. So as long as your propane um, is vaporizing properly, and you have your propane regulator set properly, it's kind of like air in a tire pressure. You're looking at six ounces of pressure, um, but we don't talk around, we don't walk around talking about six ounces of propane pressure. We say 11 inches of water column. So up in Canada, they use kilometers per hour down here in the United States, we use miles per hour. I still look out the window and the trees are going by about that fast. And I might say 60 miles per hour or whatever that is in kilometers. It's a different scale, but the speed's the same. So when we talk about propane, which we're going to get into with that picture, we're using inches of water column, which is the same thing as six ounces of pressure. Consumed as a vapor. Okay, so if I'm putting propane vapor into that uh, heat, uh, into that burner head with just enough amount of oxygen, then I have a beautiful glowing flame and it's creating all kinds of heat. If I have anything other than oxygen and the right amount of vapor, I'm gonna get some strange stuff. What would cause that? Overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly. Every time I've seen that, there's oil in the propane line. And so what that means is oil's not a vapor. It's heavy and it burns in hot spots. And then you get situations like that. Oftentimes what we will see is a burner head like that. It looks perfect on the top, but you flip it over, there's a hole burned in the bottom of it and it's all deformed. So a picture like that would be an indication right out of the gate without doing any proving of anything upstream. But when I see that, I say there's oil in your propane line. That then begets the question, where does the oil come from? Uh, there's a lot of information out there on where the oil comes from, but if you're waiting for it and you really wanna know where the oil comes from, I will tell you. The oil is coming from the pigtails that you connect to your cylinders. So you go get your cylinders filled and you put them on the front of your RV or on the sides of your RV. You connect a little green hose to them. That little pigtail right there that could be all of this long or even longer, the, they're under a tremendous amount of pressure. We don't know. It could be anything 375 PSI or, or less because if it gets over 375 PSI, there's a, on the service valve on the top of your cylinder, on the opposite side of where you connect your little connector on, there's a little port that shoots out. And so if your cylinder gets greater than 375 PSI, it will start to vaporize out of that little vent hole. That is to say that those pigtails can see anything up to 375 PSI. So different manufacturers do it different ways. I have a, we're preparing for a propane class. And so if you were to take one of those pigtails and cut it in half, so I've got my little pigtail here and I cut it kind of like that. And that gives you, I'm not even gonna try to figure out how to draw this, okay? Um, there you go. 
And so then you have, uh, I want you to visualize a straw, okay, that's embedded inside of this hose. And so you've got this rubber hose, and then sometimes different manufacturers will put different membranes inside the hose to prevent this leaching effect. But all that oil and everything is being sucked out of the hose and getting inside of your, your, your pigtail. You'll see the oil in the regulator, okay? A lot of people believe that the oil is coming from the propane, but propane is a clear, odorless, colorless liquid. Um, it is siphoned off the very, very top of the, so they'll take crude oil, put it in these big burners, or if you will, and the very top of that is where we get the propane out of it. Just below it is the octane, and just below that we have different anes and uh, um, alkanes, alkenes, alkynes coming off of it. And down here at the bottom you have like ship oil, okay? So you have all these different layers. At the very, very top, the vapor, there's no oil component. It's hydrogen and carbon. That's all that is. It's H something, C something. It's hydrogen and carbon. There's no oil element, even though you have, well, there and carbon is high oxygen and all. So basically it's hydrogen and carbon is all propane, odorless, colorless liquid. It comes through here. So where does this oil come from? It's coming from your pigtails, folks. It's not coming from overfilling. You can overfill your cylinder, but if you've overfilled your cylinder, the, the telltale sign is you're going to have a problem with your regulator freezing up and you're gonna have other problems. So what happened there? What we see oftentimes is the oil in the line. It's gonna to start to clog out. You'll do an LP pressure test on your RV and you'll have the LP pressure. You have your six ounces of 11 inches of water column, but then you do the flow test, the 50% load test, and the thing drops to zero because it's constricted on your gas side of your RV. When you go to move your little pigtails, if they're, you can look at them like an old tire that's been sitting in a garage for years. It's all crackly and it's hard to bend and it's crackly. Well, that's because it's lost all of the, the emollients in it that caused it to be all rubbery because they're in your system. Anyway, you blow out your lines backwards. So I start from the furthest point and I get my compressed air disconnected from the regulator, get a compressor with, you know, and you blow the line out. Then you go to the next point, you blow the line out, get the next one, blow the line out. And you'll, it's fun to have a rag right there where the hose is that connects to your regulator. It's all the snot and all the stuff that comes out of it. Um, one more point on that. We see it overwhelmingly at the, at the furnace because a furnace is the most propane consuming appliance. So it's really guzzling this propane, whereas your stove, your refrigerator, um, water heater, they're sipping it. They're not guzzling it like the furnace will. And you can look, you can run around your RV, look at all the BTU ratings of your furnace, look at the BTU rating of your refrigerator, look at the BTU rating of your stove, look at the BTU rating of your water heater, and you will see that the, the furnace BTU rating is much, much higher than all the others, okay? So I've talked about a lot of things, but that problem you're seeing there is overwhelmingly because of oil in the line or something other than propane vapor and oxygen that would cause it to burn irregular um, and cause that tertiary structure looking thing going on with that burner head, okay? Oil's coming from your pigtails. Um, if you have that, go look at your pigtails. They're gonna be probably hard to bend. Um, I know Marshall Excelsior, their pigtails are a little bit hard to bend right out of the factory. That's because they put this stiffening straw inside of it. You can cut it and you can see it's more of a white membrane. Um, your Camco is a little bit easier to bend, okay? But um, the reason they're hard and easy to bend is because uh, well, the manufacturer will put an extra membrane in the inner part of it. So take your old hose, cut it in half, and just kind of look at it. So that's where that's coming from. It's coming from the pigtail. We talked about that. So I hope that answered that one. Okay. And then some. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And so Les is tuning in, and he has a pre queued question. Okay. Um, so he says, a question regarding if the DC element in the fridge will increase its watt slash BTU output with higher voltage is okay. one that has come up recently. This is because many have found the refrigerators are working better with higher voltage lithium batteries. Ohm's law would seem to support this. I'm interested to hear Darren's opinion. We believe we have discovered why others have reported they are getting better cooling after they switched to lithium batteries. This was in a follow-up email. Okay, okay. And if someone uses a DC slash DC charger, such as the new adjustable Victron, one could deliver a steady and constant voltage to the refrigerator using the DC operation mode. Okay. If increasing the voltage, which increases wattage, as we have shown, is a safe and efficient way to increase the BTU output of the DC element, this might allow others to consider using the DC operation while traveling instead of using gas. So thoughts. Got a lot in that one. Um, 
So let's go there. Okay, so if I were to distill out the meat of that question, we're talking about Ohm's law, Watt's law. We're talking about the BTU rating from a Watt. Um, you're, you're, that's what you're getting into. It does not matter if it's a lithium battery or a liquid filled battery or an AGM battery. That's not part of this discussion, okay? I don't think that refrigerator cares what kind of, where the 12 volts comes from, okay? So whether you're using a DC-DC converter, whether you're overclocking it or ramping it up, or if we were talking about engines, we might talk about chipping the engine or putting on a new manifold. You're just trying to get more out of that engine, right? If we were talking about computers, you might talk about overclocking your processor to try to get more out of that um, processor to make that processor do more, okay? So uh, now what, what I'm understanding is you're wanting to get you're wanting to feed that heating element instead of, so the spec is 12 volts, okay? But it's usually closer to 13, 13.6. So you're wanting to feed that heating element more voltage. As the voltage goes up, the amperage goes down. We use um, uh, Watt's law, Ohm's law to do the calculation on that. So it's easy enough to, to distill that out, but let's just get away from the math for a second. Let's talk about something else. What I'm understanding you saying is by having more BTUs at the refrigerator, the refrigerator is going to work more efficiently. Okay, so now we've 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 gotten rid of what kind of battery you're using. That has because the question I'm hearing is making the refrigerator work more efficiently. That's what I'm distilling it out of this. So, if the question is let's make the refrigerator work more efficiently, um, then. I don't see the difference between running a DC heating element at 12 volts versus 14 volts as really making a big difference, okay? So if you do the math on that, a, let's just say, let's just take a typical 300 watt heating element, okay? They vary from 215 to 300 to 325, but let's just take 300 watt heating element just to give us some math. So we're gonna hit that 300 watt heating element with 12 volts, that's going to generate about 1,024 BTUs of heat. If we take that same exact heating element, 300 watt heating element, and we hit it with 14 volts, that's going to generate 1,074 BTUs of heat, a difference of about 50 BTUs. So what's, what can you do with 50 BTUs? Well, a single candle burning you know, to set the right mood is about 50, uh, about 75 to 80 BTUs. So what we're talking about between the 12 volt and the 14 volt that you're going to feed this 300 watt heating element is about 50 BTUs. Not really worthy of discussing getting an extra 50 BTUs out of it by hitting that heating element with 14 volts over the 12 volts. You'd be better off by just taking your 300 watt heating element and putting in a 325 watt heating element or a 350 watt heating element. If you want, if, if, if you're approaching this from the perspective of by me putting more heat into my refrigerator boiler is going to make my refrigerator work more efficiently or work, make it work better, then why pursue this from the perspective of, well, let's play around with our batteries and feed this thing 14 volts and all this kind of stuff when it's still a 300 watt heating element. You might as well just put a bigger, a bigger heating element in it. Okay. So in our example, instead of a 300 watt, put a 325. But if you're going to do that, a lot of, you know, I was an engineer for most of my adult life for about 30 years. I was a professional engineer and a lot of things that we worked on was designing things to specification. So we get into the discussions on this, where people are talking about, they'll buy a pickup truck. And I don't know, let's say I'm making this up. Let's say the pickup truck is designed to carry a thousand pounds. Uh, just stay with me on this analogy. The pickup truck is designed to carry a thousand pounds payload. Okay. And um, well, that's not that much if you got your trailer on it. So we're going to put more springs on this thing and we're going to put the weight distribution hitch on this thing. And we're going to do all this kind of stuff to make that truck carry 2000 pounds. So now I got a truck that can carry 2000 pounds. Really? Well, when the manufacturers made that little fancy sticker and they put it on your door plate, and they say what your gross vehicle weight rating is and they say what your uh, towing weight is and all this kind of stuff. 
They put a lot of thought into that, and that had to be passed through all kinds of tests to make that every sure that every bolt, nut, screw, everything was rated for what that sticker said it was for. And so now we're running around going with aftermarket stuff to put stuff on our truck that makes our truck carry more. So it's almost like, I don't mean to be like bold or anything, but it's like, so you know more than what the engineers know? You know more than those guys because you got your weight distribution hitch and you got your, your new suspension and your new shocks and all this kind of stuff. It's not about what it can carry. It's handling, it's stopping ability, it's maneuverability under, uh, you know, in my career, I worked a lot with variable frequency drives. And in variable frequency drives, these are these big three-phase drives that'll start a big three-phase motor and do all kinds of stuff. I could get a six-year-old to figure out how to program those things to start the motor. It's stopping that motor, which is where all the engineering comes in, because you got all this inertia. What do you do with all the energy, the electromagnetic flux that's flowing through these three? So if you are, know what I'm talking about with a three-phase variable frequency drive, it's not about starting, it's about stopping those things. So when you're talking about taking your, your, your thousand pound payload capacity and doing all these modifications to your truck to make it carry 2,000 pounds, it's not about starting, putting on your blinker, turning on, you know, chamber of commerce type weather. It's, it's how that reacts in um, emergency situations. So we understand that, that's my position on that. So now you're gonna take your heating element that's rated, so some engineer in some cubicle somewhere figured out that in order to make that refrigerator work at that BTU for that boiler, for this, for the sodium chromate to do what it needs to do, for the ammonia to boil the way it needs to boil, 300 watts is the exact right spec. And then we're gonna come in aftermarket and we're gonna say, nope, let's put a 325 in there. Is that refrigerator gonna work the same way? I don't know, it might make it hotter, but now maybe the steel's not rated for that. Maybe the, 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 the ratio of the rectifier in your refrigerator wasn't designed to boil that hot. So there's more to it than just making it hotter. Um, anyway, so I like going to spec. I really do. Why? Because some engineer somewhere, a team of engineers that put their stamp of approval and got it UL approved and all that's gonna say that's what it's supposed to be like. I cannot tell you how many service calls I've been on, dozens, where it's a refrigerator performance issue and we get called in and one of the things I'm looking at is I wanna check the ohms value on that heating element at room temperature and I'm gonna compare it to what the book says it's supposed to be. Many, many, many times the wrong heating element is installed in that refrigerator. Um, more times than not, it's, it's a smaller wattage, so it's not getting enough heat. But um, I, can, I can just imagine they brought it to some shop somewhere and all the heating elements look the same. They all have these little candy cane looking things on the top of two wires coming out, unless there's a dual kind. And they fit in the same socket, you know. So it's very easy to take a 125 watt heating element or a 215 watt heating element or a 325 watt heating element, stick it in the same spot. Very easy, happens all the time. Why? Because I'm the one that finds that and fixes it, put the right heating element in it, the refrigerator works fine. So my take on this, I talked about the truck, talked about re-engineering things, talked about spec, talked about what uh, the manufacturer's design was, their vision for that was. And um, uh, I would, put the heating element in that it's designed for. Um, I would not try to take a 300 watt heating element and put a 325 in to make my refrigerator go hotter because now you're looking at other problems. Um, if I wanted my refrigerator to work more efficiently, I would make sure my chimney was perfect on the backside, zero on the sides. I've drawn pictures many times on the, how to make a refrigerator effective with your chimney. If my refrigerator was in down the south where it's like 160 degrees and I feel the side of my, my, my wall, like if this is the side of my, my RV and the refrigerator's right on the other side and this wall is really, really hot, I would put a window awning or an awning or something to shade this. I would do that with it. Make sure that my chimney was as good as my chimney could be. Make sure that if it's in a slide room that my con um, condenser fin, that all my air coming up would go through the condenser fin. Make sure that my two fans, which is what the manufacturer specs, make sure my two fans are working to suck the air in down below here and pull it up over here. Uh, those are the things I would do to make my refrigerator work more effectively. I don't know that I would worry about what kind of batteries or how much voltage I'm sending because you're only dealing with less heat than what a candle puts out. Um, but having said that, I am all ears. I'm eager to hear what you guys have done. Like I said, I'm an engineer at heart and I love designing things. Um, but I also like to, so if you're asking Darren Meyer V Works technician, I'm going to say go to spec. That's my stock answer. Um, 
So you might get it to work great for a year or two, but it got too hot and now you've ruptured your thing. Now you got a leaker and I got to buy a new cooling in it. So um, anyway, I'm going to land my plane on that. Um, good question. I did a little bit of homework on it and um, to figure out how many BTUs. I figured out the BT, the watts to BTU. It's a, it's a formula. It's a calculator. Just like the wattage to BTU calculator. And you can start playing around with that. And, um, and then I played around with Ohm's Law, Watts Law to get my numbers. So um, I like these kind of questions. It was a lot of fun. And... Um, but that's my takeaway from trying to make a refrigerator work more efficiently by giving the heating element more juice than it's rated for. So there's that. All right. <sighs> that's great. OK, so if you're just joining us now, um, welcome. It's our monthly live stream where we take your questions and answer them live. So we take your questions live and answer them right on the spot. So right if you are joining us and you have a question, um, we have time for, we've collected some that have already been asked, uh, but uh, we have a couple more we could get to. So if you have a question, anything related to RVs, um, you can go ahead and put that in the chat and just make sure that you put the manufacturer of the specific appliance, so not your not your RV. We don't need to know if it's, you know, a Jayco or a Winnebago. We don't need to know if it's a Sunseeker. Like, we don't need all of that information, but whether it's a Dometic, a Norcold, Suburban, and then the model number. Um, and I also wanted to let you all know and encourage you to go join us over on Patreon. So we have an exciting announcement and release that we'll be doing uh, in the next couple of weeks. Yay. And um, if you wanna be the first to know and the first to have access to that, you'll wanna be over on Patreon. So you'll see that link posted here shortly. Go ahead and click on there. You can join at, at any level. Um, you can even join there for free. For free. Uh, and you will still be the first to know and the first to be able to access. Well, not the first first. Our RV tech tier is like the first first. Yeah, those are our top tier. <laughs> these are these are RV techs that we um, really love. But you will on. get to at any at any tier level, you will get to um, uh, to access that before uh, it's released to the public. So uh, join us over there on Patreon. And now we are going to get to our first live question. Okay. So, and there's been a little chat already back and forth about this um, in, you know, between some of our viewers, um, but I'll still go ahead and ask you. Okay, so, now I'm nervous. DP, okay. <laughs> yeah, let's see if you get the same answer. Oh my gosh. Dated. Okay, no. okay. Uh, DPMIV. I am an RVer. I have a Norcold N824 fridge that cools when on power, but does not cool on LP gas. I've tested the solenoid and igniter, they work fine. What troubleshooting steps should I take next? And I don't know if you're interested in what has been going on in the chat or if you just want to. So it works on AC, it. doesn't work on LP? Yes. Okay. Uh, does it even try to start on LP? Good question. You can feel free to add that in the okay. chat if okay. you're still. Okay, let's follow the diagnostics in. trail here. Um, so, so it works, it's Norcold. Okay, so it works on AC, wonderful. So now you know it's not the cooling unit. Yay. So. The first thing I would do on the LP side is I, I would like to know, is it even trying to start? Is it making that tick, 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 tick sound? Okay. Um, so if it's trying to start, but it's not igniting, well, now you know your control board's probably okay. Okay. So now you're looking at what you, we might call your, your gas valve, your gas train, different trades call it different things. So. What I would ask you to do, let's say it's ticking. Now, if it's not making the ticking sound, then you need to look at your control board or your electrode wire itself, okay? But let's say that it's making the ticking sound. Uh, you could even take your meter and you have your, your gas valve. So here is our solenoid. Here, here I'm gonna and just- she's, uh, Or they said, yes, it does. It lights oh, okay. fine and stays lit. Oh, but it's not getting hot? Uh, the. Oh, well, so it stays the, lit. The fridge isn't cooling. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is this is good then. Okay. So you do get your burn in your burner, little blue flame. So your LP is working, but it's not getting cold on LP. Correct. Ooh, fun. Okay. Okay. Um, you very well might have one. I'm going to say it could be one, two, three. One of three things. Okay. So thing number one. Uh, four things, five, six, seven, no. Okay, okay, so the first thing, okay, you're gonna, uh, okay, not in any order. Okay, so the first thing I would want you to do is verify your LP pressure is correct. 
Okay, so these burners, we just talked a little bit about refrigerators a minute ago, okay? So here's your big burner, okay? Um, and then here is your, oh, look at me go. Look at that, oh my goodness. Um, I'm taking a moment to draw this because it's gonna matter here in a minute. Okay, and then this goes there. So, can everybody see this? Yep, looks great. Okay, oh, and, and then there's one more thing here inside that you can't see. Okay. <sighs> now, oh, okay, and then um, one of the things you're gonna have is uh, on your gas valve, about right there, here is your solenoid with your two little things sticking out of it. Here is where the LP goes into your gas valve, okay? It's not working on LP. So you have very, okay, so you could pretty much say that the solenoid's good. You're gonna get 12 volts here. You, you yourself can give it 12 volts or you can let the control board give it 12 volts. And then from that, you should smell LP gas coming out of here, okay? So you need to check your LP. What we're looking at, if you go inside your refrigerator, you open up your refrigerator door, there's a sticker on the side. It's gonna say manifold pressure, 11 inches WC or something like that. You need to prove that you have the correct amount of propane pressure feeding this. Step one. So let's start our trail at the beginning. You need to verify. So guess what you need to do for there? You gotta get a manometer, you gotta get LP tap jigs. Oh, hey, I know where you can get some LP tap jigs. So go to our website, we sell RV tap jigs. One of the places that you could check is right here on your gas valve, you're gonna see, usually it's an Allen key, usually. So you're gonna take that little port out, it's a 1 8 inch NTP thread, okay? So one of the tap jigs we make screws directly into that. And then you connect your manometer to it and your little tap jigs, we make all these parts. So we can do talk about that. I don't wanna turn this into a commercial, but we make the tool. Um, so you're gonna check this while it's being consumed, while your refrigerator's working, and you're gonna make sure you're gonna get 11 inches water column at that point right there, okay? Um, so let's say, yay, it worked, you do. Then there is, this is on a little plate with a little screw right there. You're gonna take this, sometimes with, with this turned off, you could get a can of compressed air and you, you can blow in here. If there's any rust that's falling down inside of your boiler stack, it's gonna fall in these little slots right here and it'll kind of fill in that burner head. And so the burner head's not at 100%, it's like 50% or whatever. So you need to clean that, okay? So you also need to make sure that all these little fins, these little cuts in the top of that burner are nice and clean so that it's got a nice pretty blue flame, okay? So let me just cut to the chase and then I'll tell you how to fix it. The reason that it's working perfectly on AC but it's not an LP is because you're not getting the right amount of heat here, okay? So when you put your electric heating element in, we were talking about that earlier, um, let, let's just come up with uh, 400 degrees, okay? 400 degrees. So I need this to be 400 degrees. If I'm 400 degrees, then my refrigerator works perfectly. So therefore, referencing the video, the talk we just had, my heating element needs to be whatever size to create, in our example, 400 degrees. Therefore, the whole of this orifice, the amount of pressure on LP, the burner head, everything needs to generate uh, 400 degrees of heat. I don't care where the heat comes from. I don't care what kind of batteries you have. I want 400 degrees right here in my analogy. Now different refrigerators need different temperatures, but stay with me on this. It's working at 400 degrees on AC, but it's not an LP. Why? You're not getting it hot enough. How does LP create heat? Well, you gotta make sure you're 11 inches of water column. Check that box. You take this little screw off. I wanna say it's a 10 millimeter, but I'm just not sure. I always got my wrenches. You can unscrew this little brass orifice, unscrew that, make sure that there's no restrictions in your gas valve in here, and then look through this through the light. Um, I, I don't know if it's a Dometics or the Norcolds. I've done so many, they blur together for me. But if you hold this little piece up to a light, if it's the right one, you should see a little pink ruby color. A lot of times they'll get some carbon buildup on them. Clean that with 
rubbing alcohol and a cotton tip. Don't you dare take a file like you'd use on a MIG welder and kind of clean that thing out. It's a man-made ruby, if it's a Norcold kind. Otherwise, it's gonna be the Dometic that has a ruby. I just don't remember because I clean so many of these things, they just blur together to me. But you unscrew this and clean this to make sure, now here's where we regulate the LP pressure to the heat. The size of that hole matters. And I've seen many, many times where that hole is fouled out, clogged out, little bitty bugs will get inside of here and make all kinds of nests and things. And then so my pressure through my, my LP doesn't make it through that little bitty hole right there. So let's make sure that that hole is clean. And then you put it back in. Now, let's take this out, it's one screw, take it out, you're looking at it, clean it out really well, and make sure that all that's gone, and make sure that all your little, like, brush its teeth, okay? <laughs> so now what we've got is we've got 11 inches of water column, we've verified that our orifice is clean, we've made sure our burner is clean, so at this point, that should be perfect, okay? So I'm gonna assume that you're gonna have found something's not right there. The next thing it could be, which this is more rare, if you go to the very, very top, of your um, refrigerator, you're gonna see this little piece sticking out, okay? And that's the top of your chimney that vents out the top. Well, right in that little hole right there, you're gonna see like this little wire sticking out. And that little wire goes all the way down inside. We call it the swirler or the baffle. I've heard them called different things. A swirler baffle, if you wanna be fancy. And what that is, you pull this thing out, it's pretty long. At the very end of it, it's gonna have this little corkscrew looking deal, okay? And you will know that it's there if you take all this out it, when it's cold. You can take your finger and you'll feel the bottom of this thing, okay? So the purpose of this swirler is it's the same diameter of the, the pipe here. And as the flame licks up inside of this, the swirler's job is to move the heat to the outside wall and slow it down so that it has a tendency to heat the, the heat exchanger portion of your burner, okay? So why do I say that? Because if this got too hot, then what we've seen is this is starting to cook itself off and now you've got like half of it there and it's not the whole thing. It's rare, but I have seen it. I've also seen this where somebody did a cooling unit replacement and they did, when you do a cooling unit replacement, they're not gonna ship you this thing. You're gonna take it off of your old cooling unit and put it on your new cooling unit and stick it down inside. If you forget that, then you don't have the swirler, then the heat that this generates just goes right out the top. It's not being moved to the outside and it's not slowing itself down. Okay, so recapping real quick, then we'll move on. Verify you have the proper amount of LP at your gas valve. Um, verify that your orifice is clean, rubbing alcohol and a Q-tip and maybe compressed air only. Don't you dare put a pin or anything in there. Uh, make sure that's clean. Take this off, give it a good, I carry a toothbrush, okay? Get some compressed air. I, I carry cans of those little office can that you'd use on your computer keyboard. Just psh, psh, blow that out. Don't, uh, note to self, don't blow that out when it's running or you will have a large fireball here. And that's why I carry extra pairs of shorts. Um, I did that once. I'm like, psh, 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 don't, don't do that. Why? Because there's, but there's butane inside of those cans. So you just kind of jacked this thing up, didn't you? Um, so make sure that this is nice and clean um, and make sure that your swirler comes all the way down. It should be like right at the bottom there. And um, the last thing I would mention is, I don't think this is your problem, but while you're going this far, there's an electrode and that electrode comes out and you want that to be about an eighth of an inch gap between the top of this, burner and you don't want it to touch. Um, now, in the manual, they tell you how many teeth over it needs to be. I never really remember that because it's got a thing, a plate that you screw it to. And so if it's not there, it's not like you can do anything about it anyway. <laughs> it's like, well, it's only on the second fin. It's supposed to be on the fifth. It's not like you can adjust that, okay? So I don't even remember how many fins it's supposed to be over. I do know on your Norcolds, it's the 10th fin over from the right where your thermistor goes. I remember that. And so like on the Dometics, you can raise and lower your thermistor on that right hand fin. On your Dometic, they're clipped onto the 10th fin. You either move it one to the left or one to the right if it's running too high. I don't know, a little trivia bonus question for you. Yeah. So to get your LP working, it's just not getting hot enough. The, L the electric's getting it hot enough, but the, but the propane's not. So check your LP. Clean your orifice, 
give it a good tooth brushing, make sure your burner's there. One of those things is not right. You fix those things, it'll work fine. All right, okay. great. And they said uh, there is some orange on the bottom of the flame. I don't know if that makes any difference. Yeah, yeah. okay. Rust, that's mostly rust. All right, so our next question is from Gino. He says, we have a 2010 Tuscany with twin Mach 3s. Recently, the front unit has begun short cycling, but does not appear to it does not appear to be the compressor, but rather the fan motor. So it short cycles regardless whether AC is selected or if just fan only is selected. If AC is selected, you can hear the compressor continue to run for about 15 seconds after the fan stops. Replace the run and fan caps, but no change. When first turned on, the unit runs for five minutes, AC gets cold, then it shuts off for two minutes and back on for two minutes following that pattern thereafter. Not sure what to do next. Okay. Oh, and we'll see you in July. All right, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wrote, you said Mach 3, I wrote the word freeze here. Uh, when I see that, that is a blatant indicator that um, it's, uh, it's your freeze sensor either doing its job or not doing its job, okay? So these air conditioners are kind of dumb. Okay, and they rely on sensors feeding it information. In other words, that is to say that control board is not just randomly turning itself on and off. It's being told to turn itself on and off. That motor is, that compressor is not randomly telling itself to turn on and off. It's being told to turn itself on and off by some sensor somewhere. As an RV tech, what we do is we have to figure out, we have to, to, to translate what the problem is. So what's causing this compressor to, to short cycle? What's causing this, refer, this air conditioner to short cycle? Uh, the first, my knee jerk reaction is your freeze sensor, okay? Um, that's my first reaction. What other things could cause this? Low on refrigerant, okay, would cause this cycle. Um, the, the, um, on the top of your compressor, you have this little screw thing that takes this little cover off. You have a overload relay on there, an overload, um, oh shoot. If, if, if the current gets too great, it'll turn itself off. I don't think that's your problem. Um, so let's talk about this freeze sensor, okay? Let's talk about that. So here you have the, uh, is it absorber or is it evaporation? This would be the evaporation, okay? Because refrigerators have absorber coils, air conditioners have evaporation coils. And I, I just, just stay with me if I get it backwards. I know this, I just don't know the, the, the terminology. So this is your little, uh, yeah, okay. So they go like that, okay? And then let's just make this a little three dimension because we're about to talk about something for a second. If you are inside your RV, so now some of these you can't get to them from the inside, you gotta get it from the top. But let's just say I can take that ceiling plenum down where I'm gonna clean my filter every month anyway. And I look up inside of the flashlight, well, I'm gonna see something that looks like a radiator, okay? That is the, I just said it, it's the evaporation. Yep, it's, a, it's the evaporation coil, okay? It needs to be cleaned. Another thing that would cause a short cycle is this thing's all full of dander and dirt and all this kind of stuff. So this thing's typically, I don't know, two inches thick. Let's just ballpark it. I've never really measured them, but it's, it's, it's got some thickness to it. And it's full of these little fins. And then what they do is they have the, the copper tubing going round and 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 then goes back to the compressor. So here we have the evaporation taking place. And as the refrigerant evaporates, it acts as a sponge, it absorbs the heat, and then it goes to the compressor. And what does the compressor do? Oh, it compresses <laughs> like a sponge, wringing out all that heat. And that's what you feel on the other uh, compressor coils on the outside of this thing, they get kind of hot. Now you got the metering device. We're not gonna get into all that. Let's talk about your short cycling. So this freeze sensor is gonna be connected I, I, the reason I talked about it being two inches thick is because you, your free sensor on your Mach 3s, I believe it's got a white little heat shrink cap that on the end of it with little two white wires that come out of it. Um, I usually just kind of take a very small electronics screwdriver or my little pick, ice pick tool and just kind of wiggle, wiggle very gently, wiggle, 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 wiggle right inside of my fins here. And I take that free sensor and I put it right inside of there and then I'll take it and I'll close up the fins to kind of embed that free sensor directly into my radiator fin thing here, right? So wonderful, that's where they go. If it's just floating out in here somewhere or it's 
has faulted or if the wire is cut, well, what's the purpose of this free sensor? The purpose of this free sensor is to tell the control board the temperature of this. Um, when it's short cycling like this, another thing I want you to do is get up on the roof, take off the cover of this thing and gain access to this thing. You're gonna, you might see a large layering of ice all up on top of this thing, okay? An indication that the free sensor is not working right. It's an easy task. I carry a couple spare ones just to plug it in. Um, so if your air conditioner is starting and stopping like it's supposed to, it's not gonna be your capacitors. Um, it could be your compressor, um, only because on the top of the compressor, I think it's a blue wire or a black wire, where it goes through a, a high current limit, uh, like a circuit breaker thing. Ah, it's got a name. It's not the I, G, I, inter, it's not the, it's got alphabets letters to it. It's not that, okay? It's basically if too much current goes, I believe it's rated to 65 amps. You can see that on the nameplate, RL locked rotor amp rating is what it's set for. I don't think that's your problem. I think your problem is your freeze sensor. So that gets another question is what would cause it to freeze? One, we spent a few minutes talking about the freeze sensor, where it needs to go, um, how you set it in there. Uh, two, it could be that your refrigerant is low. Sometimes, not always, when your refrigerant's low, the pan that this fits in, okay, you might see a little bit of oily residue. I usually see it on the right-hand side for some reason. I rarely see it over here. I always kind of see this little oily residue over here, that would be an indication that it's lost its refrigerant. Um, so we see that. Uh, one of the things I'll be doing pretty soon is I've got a couple air conditioners are gonna be slicing and dicing them open. A lot of oil will come out of them, which is kind of cool. So if it's short cycling, let's look at this as a freeze up type of problem. Let's start looking at our freeze sensor. It could be the control board. Maybe the freeze sensor, the little white thing is doing everything right. It's doing everything it's supposed to do, but the control board's what's bad. Um, in that instance, I heard you say you have one or two air conditioners. You've got more than one. So that's when, for troubleshooting purposes, I might move the freeze sensor from one to the other. Did the problem stay with the air conditioner or did the problem stay with the freeze sensor? Um, I might even, if I was really desperate, I might even move my whole control board back and forth. You might need to flip a, a little dip switch on it to tell it it does or does not have a furnace or what zone it is but um, it's not a big deal. And I would start moving things around. Does a problem stay with the air conditioner or does a problem stay with the component? And then you start to whittle out the problem. So um, hopefully that helps. But those, when you're telling me it's short cycling, I'm thinking freeze ups is overwhelmingly my, my thing. And that's come to the thumbs up, some of the thoughts I would go through on how to diagnose that. All right. Uh, Karen says, uh, we are RVers, so we know we asked at the beginning, yeah, are you an RVer, are you right. an RV tech? I What's am too. What's your involvement with RV? I woke up in an RV this morning, been waking up in an RV for 17 years. So, okay. She says, we have uh, a question about whether stripping um, for a Schwintech slide out, Okay. Uh, where to purchase any special tips. Okay. Oh, they want to, yeah, so they want to replace the weather stripping on their Schwintech slide out. Um, Lippert? Okay, Lippert would be my first go-to there, but um, ATP makes a lot of weather stripping for that. Um, if, if, okay, so, so there's different types of weather stripping on the Schwintech systems. One is the big wiper seal, okay, that flips in and out. A lot of times that wiper seal, it's got, I'm gonna draw a profile of it. So let's assume you're talking the wiper seal, okay? Uh, overwhelmingly, that is going to be with this super, hateful 3M double-sided tape. Love the stuff, hate to have to get it off. Um, but let me do a straight down profile of what that looks like. So here's your wiper seal, okay? And then it's gonna have like a little, this is the rubbery part, so this can flex. Then as it gets here, it starts to get a little thicker, and then it's gonna go to this little profile, okay, which is hard plastic. And then you're gonna have this little, little, I don't know if you guys can see that. It's called an EK base, okay? And then you have this reverse profile thing that's called the D seal, okay? Um, so there's two parts to this. The D seal, which is this bulb seal or a D seal, we call it a D seal because it looks like a D. <laughs> no surprise there, no, no tricks there. So the D seal here, let me draw that a little bit better, does have a little bit of a profile on the back of it, okay? 
And, and I'm thinking you're gonna to wanna to replace the D seal, not the wiper seal. But sometimes the wiper seals need to replace too. These are a bear to replace, these are super easy. So if, if it's a D seal you wanna replace, so now that we're talking about these little like train tracky thing that slides in itself, it's really simple, okay? You can buy that product. Um, I'll make a link, I'll make a whole thing on our Amazon affiliate links for all these types of EK based type products. Um, so, and I know Amazon's got it. I'm pretty sure they do. It's made by ATP. So here is our RV, okay, in all of its glory. Okay, here's the wheels. Beautiful. And then here is the slide out, okay. And here's our Swintec slide out. Okay, so if if you're if the seal you want to replace, let's say it's the the D seal, the the bulb seal that you want to replace. What I want you to do is peel up this little corner, just take your finger and peel it up a little bit, you're gonna find a screw with a Robinson bit. It's a square number two bit. You're gonna just peel this up, it's hidden back behind there. You're gonna peel that up, take that screw out. Rarely is there one at the top, but sometimes there might be. You take that screw up, this whole thing's just gonna slide right out like a train track. You take your new, you buy it in a box with 50 feet in it, in a, in a box, the part number is a 50 foot box, and you slide your new one right up in there, and you put your screw right back in the bottom and it's hidden. So that's if it's the EK base type product, which overwhelmingly is what these Schwintex have. If it's a wiper seal kind, um, those are a little bit harder to replace. Um, the double-sided tape is painless, is just hateful. Um, and when you get around your, your, ra your racks, the, the tracks, you do need to cut it to a weird profile. So you take the old one off, lay it down and kind of notch it out. So, there's that, and so I'm gonna make a note to self to make links on our Amazon affiliate store for all this wiper seal stuff that I think you might be talking about. So, hope that helps. So, okay. let me, where's my phone? I wanna make a note. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna make a note to myself right now. You got it? Okay, thanks, Anne. Anne just arrived, so we're excited about that. Yeah. Okay. okay, so Ricky uh, says, uh, HWH325 series bedroom slide. How can pressure be released so it can be manually pushed out? Manually pushed out. On your HWH, they have a couple, uh, you told me it's a 320 thing, but I don't keep that in my head. Um, on your solenoid, you're going to have like a little uh, um, off-white colored lever. Is that the kind you have? Or do you have the kind with a little, uh, there's three different types of solenoids that they use on the HWH. One, the kind we love has a lever you lift up, okay? The other kind has a, a screw, and I always have to look this up because you only ever turn it a quarter turn or something, and if you turn it too much, you messed up. And the other one's got a like a 5 16 nut or something. I know what I'm looking at it when I see it. So two things to try there. One is flip up the lever for the solenoid, okay? But you want to manually push this thing in? Is it because the motor failed? because there's something that we would do in an emergency situation, which I'm about to tell you about, but I wanna know why you wanna push this thing in manually, because that's a hard thing to do. Okay, yeah, why don't you go ahead and join in the comments. Do you want me to go to the next one and come back? Oh, I'll or? just I'll just throw this out there while we're on here in case okay. we don't get around. Best case scenario, flip up the lever that's locking the solenoid so that you release the pressure and then you can do what you want to with it. In an emergency, in an emergency situation where that's not an option and it's just not working and something's really, really messed up, the only thing we can do in a situation like that, and we've had to do this several times, emergency situation only, is to get yourself some hazmat pads, okay? These things absorb the oil, crack the line. It's gonna be under tremendous pressure. So when you crack that line, you're, gonna, you're not gonna just go to town on it, start taking that nut off that's on the hydraulic line. You're gonna be very gentle and when you get to that point where it releases, it's gonna release under tremendous pressure. It will hurt you. So I wrap this thing up with these hazmat towels. It's gonna to make a huge mess. Emergency use only. And then when it starts to bleed itself out, but at first it's like taking a soda can, shaking it up really good, popping the cap. That's what you're dealing with. Go in eyes wide open knowing that. Clean up, don't leave a mess all over the place. Get your towels around. Crack that line, let the pressure explode on you. And then you bleed it off and then you own it. You can do whatever you want to with it. And then when you get it in, reconnect everything and hope that it held it there, but I'd still use a ratchet strap or something or blocks of wood to hold it in place. We have had to do that in emergency recoveries just to keep the people to the shop or something like that. So those are, one is release the solenoid, two is crack the line. If you crack the line, be careful, it's under a lot of pressure. Okay. 
All right, and so our next question comes from Dan. Hi, Dan. Uh, changing to lithium house batteries, but chassis is less, chassis is lead acid. Changed WFCO, Wufco, I don't know, Wolfco, what do you say, yeah, yeah. Charger to auto detect to handle lithium Good. or lead acid. Question is, how do I protect the alternator from getting overcharged? Oh boy, there's a, oh, it's a little thing that looks like this. It's got three screws on it and two little screws up here. Um, BMO, it's green. It's got a green label on it. Um, uh, I could have been prepared for this, but it's it's a BMO, Lebo. It, it, somebody knows what I'm talking about. It's a black molded box with three screws on it and two little screws up here. And it's usually got a green label on it. And I can't remember what the letters are on the B -I -M, thing. B-I-M, he said? BIM? BIM? Yeah, something like that, yeah. That's what you would use, one of those. It's an isolation relay thing that's going to allow your alternator to do what the alternator does for your chassis batteries and let your lithium batteries do what your lithium atom does for that. If you really want to be hardcore, they have DC-DC converters. Um, we put some of those on. Um, if you really want to be hardcore, but typically this is what we would put on the, the coaches that they have lithium for their house and lead acid for their chassis. And that allows the alternator to do what it does. And I, I don't remember the names, but it's something that looks not exact, it's not to scale, but I remember <laughs> it's weirdly shaped like that because sometimes I got to figure out how to make this thing fit. And um, you got two little control screws up here. One's ignition. I don't remember the other one. It, it, it's written on there what they do. And when I get one, like, oh yeah, I know what to do with these things. Um, but anyway, that would do it. Okay. And then back to just our previous question. He says hydraulic hose busted and cannot get to cylinder under bed. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so, well, if your hydraulic hose busted, you should be able to move it. If not, loosen the other ones, loosen the other ones, loosen the other ones until you own this thing. And you're going to make one a hell of a mess of the, um, it's called ATF Dextron 3, you know, which is the, the red fluid you're going to use. So just keep loose. If, if in emergencies thing, you got to get this thing fixed so you can put your hose on it. Just start loosening hoses until you can free this thing up. If it is a big slide room, then HWH uses a synchronization cylinder. Those are a bear. Um, if you have a synchronization cylinder, best practice on those is um, keep them synchronized. I could tell you horror stories. Winnebago was using these uh, synchronization cylinders and oh my gosh. Um, I got quite an education on how all those things work. It's fact, we took them apart just like, oh, that's fascinating. So best practice on your synchronization cylinder is when you're bringing your slide room in and you're hearing the motor, ee, make the noise, keep your finger on the button, let that thing be like, ee, go up really high to like 12,000 PSI or something ridiculous like that. And that lets all these little chambers equalize and fill themselves up. Um, we would find people that had the, the slide room with the synchronization cylinder and they would, that humid would stop it before it went. And then the chambers inside the synchronization cylinder weren't all even. And so the room would start messing up, uh, just a little extra stuff. So is that the video we just did? Was I've never done a video on those. Oh, okay. Yeah, no. Um, I don't know that I would cause that's, I enjoy hydraulics, I do, but I'm 56 years old and I don't feel like crawling around all over the place um, playing with hydraulics anymore. So those days are done. <laughs> so I also do not like doing brake jobs and jacking up your RV and carrying my jacks around. I don't like doing that either. <laughs> do I like doing it? Yes, but do I wanna carry my floor jack around with me and this jack stands and the mud? No, so you're gonna take it to a shop to do that kind of stuff. I also do like doing roofs at 56. I'm not carrying 30 pound tool back up on your roof to reseal your roof, not doing that. So, um, but on your, uh, I think you guys can relate. Okay, they're, they're, that's why they have young men to do this kind of stuff, right? Um, so um, we're the old wide sage like, oh, young man, you're not doing it right. That's my job, right? So, um, but on your, uh, your slide room, just start loosening, <laughs> label them. And don't use a paint pin, because that'll wear off. Use color-coded tie wraps. So I got these little color-coded little cable ties, and they're all different colors. And then I, that when I'm used doing anything with hydraulics or anything with an aqua hot, I will color code all my things with color-coded tie wraps. So, oh, here's a red one. Oh, it must go to this red one. Oh, here's a blue one. It must go to the blue one. And um, so then you can disconnect everything, 
And then once all the pressure's off and everything, then, then with enough horsepower and enough corn-fed boys, you can push this thing in and out and become that hydraulic cylinder. Um, if it's a synchronization cylinder, it's gonna be hard, but it can be done. So, and I don't envy the job you have before you. So, <laughs> now also on that note, when you replace that hydraulic cylinder, make sure if the inside diameter is the same. I don't care what the outside diameter is. Make sure the inside diameter is the same one that came out of it and make sure it's the same length as the one that came out of it. All that stuff matters. So if it's like, here's one that was 15 feet and it's all curled up, well, I'm gonna save me a couple bucks and I'm gonna go with a five foot hose. Don't do that. Go with the same length, the same diameter. All that matters in the equation of hydraulics, okay? All right. Um, I just wanted to remind you all that if you are uh enjoying this so far or if we've answered your question and it's helped you out you can hit that like button yeah. um and that just helps us to get out there in the youtube world and uh increase our views and um uh yeah also if we did answer your question and it helped and you think it's worth a few bucks there's a hey. little money sign there yeah. you can donate and you know all no, the money that we that. get from youtube we just reinvest back into um, Pizza. Our... No, no. <laughs> yeah. No. The New computers. We, <laughs> yeah. The things that we do on here, um, as well as developing our My RV Works Academy, which New um, to get has stuff, yet so to be like... released, but oh, maybe that's what we're talking about on Patreon. <gasps> I don't know. Ooh, Anyways. Just, yeah. Um, we reinvest it right back in to yeah. make these products better. Yeah. Um, and okay, so let's go to and our pizza. next question. <laughs> Uh, DNL machine says we have a 30 foot bumper pull trailer. Okay. The axles are flipped. Is adding mm -hmm. shock absorbers to the sus suspension a good idea? Uh, I would not be the best person to ask that question. I think the answer is yes, I've done it to mine, but for a honest scientific engineer type question, I would not be the best person to ask for that. I know my limits and drivetrain stuff <clears throat> is not something I'm really that strong with. Ask me refrigerators, furnaces, air conditioners, I'm all over those things. But when you get into driveline type things and axles, there's, there's folks out there that know a lot more about it than I do. So I know my limits and I would put shock absorbers. That's gonna just help dampen it. Um, I did have a service trailer and I did put shock absorbers on it and I made a huge difference. And I put, it was a double axle and I put that little um, who made it? Uh, nah, BAL made this thing. No, well, I, I went through two of them because I went through a school, but it's kind of like this little, um, me and my triangles, right? <clears throat> so it's one of these things and it's got these little damper things and then it's like, it made the trailer run a little bit nicer, um, I felt. Um, it just didn't make it so bouncy. Cause as a, so you've got the RV, but I've got a service trailer. And uh, so I'd get to a spot and all my stuff's all over the floor because I hit that bump. And then I go to put that shock absorber on and the stuff's not on the floor, it's still on the shelf. So it just kind of took that out a little bit. I don't think it's gonna hurt, but um, if I was gonna get into that topic, then I would wanna know weight. I would wanna know rating. I would wanna know uh, compression and damping. I, I would really wanna get into it at that level instead of just saying, oh yeah, go buy this one. I would. So like if you're asking me questions on refrigerators and heating elements, I'm better at that than how the shocks work as regards to the, the, the ratings of them, if that makes sense. So, sorry, but yeah, I don't think it would hurt, but I just don't know which, the math behind it. Okay, so. Okay, <clears throat> and uh, so Bruce says, I want to remove a cell phone extender from my roof of my RV. Okay. What would you use to fill the hole the cable went through the roof? A plug, what kind? Um, Eternabond. Okay. Eternabond. I know that that's on our website, on our Amazon affiliate link site. It's just a white tape. Um, now, when you get to Eternabond, E-T-E-R-N-A bond. Okay, I think I spelled it right, Eternabond. So you're gonna buy it in a big roll. Um, it is extremely tenacious. It's hardcore stuff. And so if this was my hole where the coax went through, then I would cut me a piece of tape and I would tape it over. And then if you really wanted to be hard, now, oh, okay, let's talk about something just for a second here. Let's, I just thought of something to add to this. It would be incorrect to take a piece of a turnabon and stick it on your roof. 
wrong. It would be correct to really clean your roof really, really well. Eternabon has a product called Eterna Prime and Eterna Clean. They're both in little aerosol cans. So to do it correctly, you would clean your roof with Eterna Clean, which is an aerosol can. I think that's the one that's got the BB in it or a little marble. You would clean it really good because you need to get that stuff down to the fiberglass or the EPDM or whatever your roof product is. So Eterna Clean is gonna do that. Then you would spray Eterna Prime on it. So it's like a sticky type of a product. And then you would cut your little piece of, of Eterna Bond tape you would put that on there, you would take a J roller and you would activate it with your pressure and that is never coming off. You'll rip your roof off if you do it that way. And if you really want it to be hardcore, then you would take your EPDM roof sealant, uh, who makes those, Dicor, uh, Geosil, Vulcan, whatever, uh, Cicaflex, as long as it's rated for your, EP, whatever roof it is, EPDM or TPO or fiberglass, just make sure that the product you're using is rated for that. And then you just do your little Dairy Queen curly Q thing around the product. That's that's it. So that's why I say it's incorrect. Just to let, there's the hole done. Well, you're going to be calling me. Well, I don't do roofs anymore. You're going to be calling somebody because it failed because you didn't do it right. So read the instructions. Um, clean it, prime it, stick it, activate it with pressure, seal around it. That's going to be your fix. And it's aerodynamic. It'll improve. improve improve your fuel mileage because this tape is just like okay. so nice <laughs> okay so don says what do you do with the old parts you replace on rvs for example air conditioner furnaces mm. um it depends on what state i'm in <laughs> oh, okay. um i'll tell two funny stories uh, okay so we started our business down in texas and uh in texas i love texas you know, so in texas um i'm not I don't have my EPA license. Like if I was an HVA tech, then I would have my license to be able to do recharging of refrigerators. But there's a license you're supposed to have that, that says, yes, you can reclaim these and all this kind of stuff. So I don't have that license. And um, so we were, it was explained to us through an authority that if we are found doing, uh, so if you go back to the eighties and you get your refrigerator manual, I said refrigerator. If you go back to the 80s and you get your air conditioner manual towards the back of the manual, 80s and 90s, those manuals for the air conditioners from the 80s, 90s, there's a whole section on how to tap into them, recharge them, put the taps in them. That's in the air conditioner manual from the manufacturer from the 80s and 90s. Not a big deal. Takes a couple tools, pick them up at Harbor Freight. After around 97, they had some Montreal protocol and all these different types of laws they came out with. It has to do with the greenhouse gases and all that kind of stuff. Well, guess what? That manual is no longer valid because if I do not have my license to go tap and fill and all this kind of stuff with my $50 Harbor Freight tools to tap it and go get my refrigerant and put it in there. Um, so it was explained to us by the authority that if we were to do that and we got caught doing that and we did not show proof of a license or training or reclamation things, it's a $20,000 fine to my business for doing something that is now considered illegal. I don't want to go get the license. I don't want to do that. So what we do as a company is I will take the air conditioner off of your RV and I will hand it to you and you can take it to an HVHC tech down the street. Let them fix it. Who does have the license? They give it back to you. You give it back to me. I go put it back on. But I'm not going to jump through all the hoops to get even more equipment in my service trailer than I already do to tap and fill. Now, having said that, so I've been very, 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 very careful about um, these air conditioners. I'd be very gentle taking them off and I didn't want anybody hiding in the bushes turning me in because they get a reward for turning me in for breaking the law. So we had them all perfectly perched on a pallet and all this kind of stuff. So then we would take them to Texas. We'd take them to the, the scrap pile where you come in, they weigh your trailer and you're like five tons. And then, then you weigh your trailer when you come out and you got beer money, right? Well, we took uh, probably 30 or 40 air conditioners that we took to the scrapyard. This big claw machine just <laughs> all the stuff. I'm like, oh my god! I hope they have their license, you know. And it was just the craziest thing because if I'm caught doing it, that's a twenty thousand dollar fine. And this big claw just grabbed all these air conditioners, and it was just 
awesome. <laughs> but anyway, so right above that that scrap yard, there's probably a hole in the atmosphere right there. <laughs> so uh, anyway, it was a funny thing. But um, so anyway, in the state in Washington, uh, they're a little bit different with their laws. I guess the environment is different above Washington <laughs> than it is above Texas. So the physics stops at the border. And that, now this state has different physical property laws on what they do. Um, uh, so in Texas, I can take my scrap and get paid for it. Here, I have to actually pay to get rid of it. It's the exact opposite. It's crazy. So um, we have found a scrap yard that we'll take it, but they don't pay us for it. Um, there is a place by the Navy Yard where we can take our scrap and they can weigh it, but you, I think you have to have a license to get it. I, I, it's, that's why I say it depends on what state I'm in. So I dig a hole and bury it. No. So what I've got right now with... Um, I've got, oh gosh, I don't know how many water heaters, refrigerator cooling units. Now on refrigerator cooling units, we get them from Cool Fun RV and Chris there, sometimes he'll, he'll, we send them back to him. If it's a Norcold 1200, he doesn't want those back. He's got about how many, a thousand Norcold 1200s. He does not want to pay the shipping to have me send back a Norcold 1200 because uh, there's so many of them. And so we keep those. And so I've got quite a few refrigerator cooling units. And my plan is to do some slicing and dicing and, and show what's inside of all the tubes and all this kind of stuff. So the air conditioners I've got, I'm going to be, for, for, you're asking what I do with them. I'm going to be slicing and dicing. I'm going to do a show and tell uh, on them. But um, so that's what I'm going to be doing. So in future videos, it may be on our platform here or it may be on a different platform that is behind a paywall to really see what's deep inside of some of these things. Let's take an air conditioner part and look at the compressor and look at that motor and why is an air conditioner weigh so much? Some of these air conditioners are hundred pounds. So what I'm gonna do is very like a cadaver, slice off the leg and slice off the arm and, and see where the weight is on these air conditioners. So my plan is to get a scale and cut off the, the, um, the condenser absorber, the radiator thing. Okay, that weighs this much, okay. And see if we could do like Kurt Jeff's law and come out with, uh, Okay, well, the whole air conditioner weighs 100 pounds. Let's see if we can figure out where all that comes from. So I'll be doing that. I'm probably going to put that on a platform that's behind a paywall because that's going to be a little bit deeper than what we would do here. But um, when I'm done with it, then it would go to the scrapyard that will take it. And um, honestly, uh, once I do a transfer of ownership from me to the scrapyard, it's on them on if they have their EPA license to burn a hole in the ozone because they did whatever they did with it. Um, there are places where if you disassemble it and well, here's my copper, here's my aluminum, you could make more money. But um, we've got, I know a guy that does that. He'll take all the scrap and he'll basically quadruple his income from the scrap by saying, okay, here's all copper, here's all aluminum, here's all steel. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to bring it to a yard and let them figure it out. So there's my answer on that a little bit longer than maybe we were expecting, but um, that's what I do with them all. But yeah, it does generate a lot. Okay. Um, okay, so we're going to get to our last question. Gerald, I'm sorry. I don't think we're going to have time to get to your question. We'll see. Maybe we will. Um, but before, uh, before I ask you the last question, just want to remind you all that we do have a big announcement um, and something new that you'll be able to access in the next couple of weeks that we'll be um, uh, telling you about over on Patreon. So I'm going to post the link right now. And um, so go ahead and join us over there on Patreon. Um, you can join at any level, even the free level. Um, and like that way, it, yeah. yeah, that way you can know um, what's going on first. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see. Uh, Serge says, uh, what is your thought about installing a fridge depend? Fridge Defend ARP okay. on a, a Dometic fridge, or I assume anyone they'll work on. Um, I, I know we're running along, so I'll go quick. I, I put in quite a few of them. I think it works great. Um, I think that the control board, so it, I mentioned something earlier. I was talking about refer, um, <coughs> air conditioners. They're dumb. They don't understand a lot of things, and we have to give them communication. So what that ARP thing does is it gives for the first time, these control modules know if they're level or not. For the first time, they know if they're too hot. Um, so I'm all I'm a huge fan of, of that type of stuff. Let the refrigerator do what the refrigerator does, but let's turn it off if it's off level. Let's turn it off if it gets too hot. Um, they do have some additional fans in different places to help it 
run more efficiently. So yeah, I'm a big fan of that kind of stuff. Um, I have a desire to come out with some of my own stuff for different things. I'm working on some more long range projects called RB Dashboard, which we'll be talking about later, um, which is like really cool. Imagine having me in a box living in your RV 24-7, 365, monitoring all of your components and things. So that's what I'm working on. My whole background's in engineering, so I'm gonna bring that into this realm. And um, so I'm a big fan of that. Uh, we have a saying in my former career, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And so what a company like that is providing, ARP, is they're providing something where they can measure it, therefore it can be managed. So I, I like that. I like that and I like other companies that are doing things like that. And I think that as we get the Arduinos of the world and the, uh, the Raspberry Pis and, and systems like that, uh, embedded things, it's making it so easy for creators and makers to come out with systems for RVs, for components, for appliances um, to make, make things measurable so they can be managed. So for those reasons, I'm a big fan. Okay, and we are gonna get to your question, Jared. A little quicker. Um, and yeah, okay, so been getting calls to fix generators on Class B units, but they stick those things <sighs> under the chassis and access is limited. Yes. How do dealers service these things? With a pit? Okay, so when I used to do generators, I used to carry around those little ramps and you just back the RV up on the little plastic ramps you get from Harbor Freight or whatever. And that gave me access. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, again, it, you're, you're on your back, it, it's yucky. Um, so yeah, and you know those ramps I'm talking about, they, they're sort of plastic, you just, you just drive up on them and back up on them, chalk the wheels, and now you've got a little bit more room to get under there and work on those things. Um, it's a good business. Um, the reason I got out of it myself is that's a whole other set of tools. I had to carry the ramps and my trailer was getting bigger and bigger. And as a mobile service guy, I was running out of room in my trailer. So I had to actually cut out some stuff, but that's what I used to do back in the day. The challenge we got into on generators on the big class A's, you mentioned class B's, <coughs> they put them right there by their back axle. <coughs> Not only did they put the generators there, but they put the propane cylinder there, the AMSE tank, and the regulator is there as well, and so you need to adjust your regulator. I can't even fit in there to even get to it. So um, sometimes we've had to jack up the RV on a couple pieces of wood that we could find just to get side up so I can get under there to get to the regulator and adjust it. Um, but if you're working on a generator, you need to take panels off to get the fuel filter and the oil filter and all that kind of stuff. So you need more room. So that's what I did. Um, so there's my answer there. Okay. All right, so <laughs> that wraps it up for this Yay. month's uh, Q&A live Yay. stream. Um, now, yeah. what we're going to do is we are going to hop on over to Patreon, where if you're a paid member um, at any tier, then we do a bonus live stream. So we're going to hop on over there and answer some more questions. And um, thanks for joining us. And um, we hope to see you on the next one, or maybe we'll see you right over on Patreon. Yeah. So we do these when? We do them once a month, the first Friday of every month at 4.30 p.m. Pacific time. And or we try to, we'll sometimes life gets in the way and we have to move it around, but yeah, yeah that's that's what we aim for. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, let me just see if I can. If I'm taking a long hike up to the glacier here, I might not be available on that Friday. So I could do a lot, well, there's no internet out there, but I can do a recording from a glacier. That's kind of exciting. It takes two days to get to. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to cool. see what we have going on in May and see if we've got, it looks like Darren's May birthday's third. in May. Woohoo! I'm a May baby. Maybe. Yep. Maybe. So it looks like May 3rd, 4 o'clock or 4.30 p.m. Pacific time. So hopefully we'll see you there. And until then, have a good month. Yay. All right, guys. See you in May. Happy camping. Happy camping. Bye.